Today's scripture reading is from Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amaz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills, and the nation shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, ne neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of life. Yeah. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Are you tired of waiting? It often feels as if this is all we do, waiting in traffic, waiting to shake this cold, waiting for inflation to slow, waiting for the pandemic to subside, waiting for gun legislation to change and gun violence to end. I have to tell you in this present moment, friends, I am weary of waiting. And yet, here we are at the beginning of the Advent season, once again being asked to wait. For these next four weeks, we, along with the rest of our Christian community, embark on a journey of anticipation toward the celebration of the birth of Christ, a beautiful task, a holy task, a sacred task. And yet, one I don't feel stoked about in this current moment, why must we wait if Christ has already come? Why must we temporarily set aside the reality Christ is here with us now just to reaffirm it on Christmas Day? Friends, these four weeks allow us to acknowledge that a life of following Christ is a life of both presence and expectance. As followers of Christ, we live constantly in the reality that Christ is always with us. At the same time, we have only to look outside to see that the state of the world is not one of wholeness. We continue to wait for the day in which all will be made well and complete in the fullness of God. It is my hope that as we walk together through this time of Advent, we would be able to experience both the joy and the expectation of this season in community together. This week's passage encapsulates this tension between fulfillment and anticipation. In days to come, writes the prophet Isaiah, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills in days to come. As Isaiah, son of Amos, writes these words in the mid eighth century BCE, conflict in neighboring nations threatens the people of the Northern kingdom of Israel. These words of Isaiah are words to a people on the verge of war. Only a couple of decades later, this conflict will result in the exile of the people of Israel by the Assyrians. So what does it mean for the prophet to promise future peace when the current state of affairs is one of war? For the people of Israel, this prophecy, both in this excerpt and within the rest of the chapter, invokes the covenants God made with Moses and with David. The Mosaic Covenant was the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, including the Ten Commandments. This covenant and the laws given within it were initiated by God, and the people of Israel promised to abide by them so as to remain in right relations with God. The Davidic Covenant was the covenant God made with David 
that Israel would be ruled by David's offspring forever. As David sought God, it was intended that so too would his descendants, and thus Israel would be governed in a way that honored and stayed true to the character of God. This was the intention. However, it's easy to see with a quick perusal of the Old Testament that this is not often the case. Though the people of Israel are charged with violating the Mosaic Covenant in Isaiah 2.6 by turning to idols, God's promise to David that his offspring would rule out of Zion, out of Israel, is fulfilled in these verses in an unexpected way. Instead of being ruled by the offspring of David, Israel will be ruled directly by God. In days to come, justice and peace will still come forth from Israel, but it is now God and God's perfection that is administering justice instead of a human offspring of David. No longer will the people have to rely on a human king influenced by their own lust, greed, and thirst for power. This is a radical statement and one that will speak to the people in a radical way after they are exiled partially due to the arrogance of their king. This rule of God will be different than the rule of humans. With God as ruler, God's house, the temple of the Lord will be permanently established. With God as judge, the people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. With God as teacher, they shall not learn war anymore. When God is leading Israel, Israel shall be a place of peace. This place of peace, however, will not be solely for the people of Israel. All the nations shall come to learn these ways of peace and walk this path of light. What was once a promise to Israel is now a promise to all. Though this future rule was intended to inspire hope in the listeners of 8th century Israel, it was likely used to bring hope to the exiled community of Israel, of Judah, and the community returning to Israel following the exile in the 5th century BCE. In the midst of this hope, however, the question still remains. What does it mean for God to promise peace when there is conflict and brokenness all around us now? This question resounds in this current moment just as loudly as it did then. And it remains incredibly potent as we gather together a week after two mass shootings have left our country mourning. For the Christian, we must take up this question anew. If Christ is the Prince of Peace, where is this peace? I would like to offer three ways in which this promise of future peace can speak to us today. The first is that peace is something we learn from God. It is not something we have to muster up ourselves. The second is that peace is learned in community. Peace is not something we can or should have to learn alone. And the final is that the invitation to learn peace is the invitation to learn to create. When we choose to turn from violence, we free ourselves for the opportunity to participate in nurturing God's abundant creation. I'd like us to first consider the idea that peace is something we learn from God. Within these verses, Isaiah speaks of a future where people from all nations desire to come together and be taught God's ways of peace and light. Under God's direction, nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. I don't know about you, but in the wake of this week's events, this promise seems farther away than ever. Within the past week, as I'm sure many of you are aware, two mass shootings, one in Colorado and one in Virginia, have occurred in this country. In a week that was intended to be filled for many with family and celebration, this week was one of mourning. As a nation, we have become accustomed to mourning those stolen by bullets. We have also become adept at harming one another in the midst of mourning. Homophobic and transphobic rhetoric, the manipulation of the harmed and grieving for political gain, and the demonization of those with different views on legislative action all ooze from social media platforms and news outlets. It is not hard to see that we are trained in the art of war, in the art of harming those around us. The declaration then that neither shall they learn war anymore is one almost too radical, too beautiful, too outlandish to be true. And yet, the good news is that the God whose character is one of peace knows you, desires to be known by you, and desires to teach you the ways of peace. 
But how, one might ask, does God teach these ways of peace, especially in a moment when peace seems so far away? This leads me to the next point about the hope of peace I would like to offer you today. Peace is learned in community. In Isaiah's words to the community of Israel, all the nations shall come to the mountain of the Lord, and many people will go up together to learn these ways of peace. We learn peace together. I recognize this may seem like an ironic statement, given that I spent time reminding all of us of some of the horrific ways in which we learn and perpetuate violence among one another. However, like many aspects of the Christian life, we hold in tension what is and what could be. What is may be a world of violence and brokenness, but what could be is a world of peace and wholeness. The good news of the Advent season is that through Christ, what could be can be seen in glimmers now. Though we wait in anticipation for the day when true peace comes forever, we are able now to experience moments of peace, of the peace of Christ within our communities. I want us all to take a moment within this time we have together to reflect on where you have experienced the peace of Christ in your own life. Maybe it's through a relationship with a mentor or a mentee. Maybe it's through a small group you're a part of. Maybe it has even been through the kindness of a stranger. Whatever it is, I invite us all to take a deep breath and reflect on this moment where you have experienced the peace of Christ. Lord, thank you for these inbreakings of your peace. Though this world may be one where violence never truly ceases, we have an opportunity to cultivate the peace of Christ within ourselves and our communities. This brings me to my third and final point for reflection on this passage today. As God teaches us peace instead of war, God invites us to be cultivators and nurturers of God's abundant creation. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. I'm going to be completely honest with you all. I had absolutely no idea what a plowshare was before prepping for this sermon today. And I'm betting a lot of you may not either. Um, as is likely indicated by the name, a plowshare is a part of a tool that helps one plow the ground in order to get it ready to plant crops. It looks slightly like a shovel head, although instead of attaching to a vertical handle, it attaches to a curved handle. This imagery of swords being beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks has been taken up for artistic reflection in both religious and secular spaces. One of the most famous artistic responses to this verse comes from sculptor Yevgeny Vucetich, whose sculpture, Let Us Beat Swords Into Plowshares, is housed at the headquarters of the United Nations in New York City. The image depicts a muscular figure sculpted in bronze, holding a hammer over his head as he beats his sword into a plowshare. Others, such as poet Yehuda Amichai, write artistic reflections utilizing the imagery. Amichai wrote this entitled poem reflecting on Isaiah 2. Don't stop after beating swords into plowshares. Don't stop. Go on beating and make musical instruments out of them. Whoever wants to make war again will have to turn them into plowshares first. I was struck the day after Thanksgiving while watching the film adaptation of Les Miserables to hear an allusion to this verse within the final number of the musical. As the cast stands on the final barricade, they sing, they will live again in freedom in the garden of the Lord. They will walk behind our plowshare. They will put away the sword. The chain will be broken and all men shall have their reward. This imagery is obviously one that has captivated our collective consciousness. It is evocative and striking and radical. I find it so beautiful that the very thing this verse prophesies is being carried out in these artistic depictions. As individuals respond to these verses in song and pen and sculpture, they themselves create some cultivate out of the need to make something in the wake of destruction. 
Some cultivate under the careful tutelage of mentors. Some cultivate in collaboration with those in their communities. None create in a vacuum. None create alone. As I close this message today, let me remind you, God has an abundance of peace to give and an abundance of wisdom to pass down. God desires to share this wisdom with us in our communities, through our interactions with one another, through that which we create, and through the reality of Jesus Christ coming to dwell with us. God and God's abundant grace and love has created you to be a creator. God has not created any of us for destruction. The coming of Christ is the coming of a Prince of Peace who has taught us and continues to teach us how to beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. Christ's instruction comes to us not solely in the miraculous and the inexplicable, but through the simplicity of a manger and the tangibility of our communities. May we come to know the ways of peace instead of the ways of war. This is my message today and my prayer for us all.